and in which Monsanto tries to justify its business practices. At the heart of the opposition to GMOs is the subject of patents. This is what Monsanto calls their intellectual property, which are supposed to protect their investment. In North America, every farmer who buys bioengineered seeds must sign a technology agreement in which the farmer promises to respect the company's patent on the modified gene. Biotech crops are protected by U.S. patent law. And so I may not in any way save seed to uh, replant uh, the following year. It's uh, something that uh, is a protection for, the, for Monsanto, for biotech companies, because they literally invest millions and millions of dollars uh, to produce this new technology. And how can Monsanto know that someone, for instance, replant harvested seeds? I, I'm not sure how they, how to answer that. No, how they would how they would know if someone replanted seed? That's a good question for Monsanto. <laughs> the question is so touchy that Monsanto prefers to circumvent it by making glorious promises. In cases of unintended appearance of our proprietary varieties on a farmer's field, we will surely work to resolve the matter to the satisfaction of both the farmer and Monsanto. The reality seems much less idyllic. The Center for Food Safety in Washington, D.C. published a study on farmers sued by Monsanto for having not respected its seed patents. It found at least a hundred lawsuits and many bankruptcies. Among the victims, Troy Rush, an Indiana farmer. Our story starts back in 1999. A gentleman, and I use that term loosely, uh, showed up at my mother and father's farm, and uh, he claimed to be uh, a private investigator hired by Monsanto. And uh, he was uh, out investigating uh, farmers saving their own seed uh, and uh, asked us, uh, he'd come right out and ask us if we'd saved their seed. And uh, we told him, no, we had not, and um, offered up our herbicide purchases and seed purchases, uh, all the receipts and everything, um, told him where everything was purchased so he could go check it out for himself. Um, he, uh, he declined that, uh, that offer. And um, what occurred is then they, they sued us. Monsanto filed a lawsuit against myself, uh, my father, and my two brothers. And uh, Monsanto presented us with uh, documents that they claimed were uh, samples taken from our farms. To obtain those samples, Monsanto had to have trespassed upon our land without our permission and stole those samples. That year, I recall we had uh, 492 acres of Roundup Ready soybeans. Um, and they were, they were grown under contract for a company for seed. Um, and the contract was very specific. It spelled out the specific fields. So it wasn't a problem in isolating those fields. Um, everybody knew it. And why did you settle out of court with, with Monsanto? Well, after two and a half years of this, uh, the family was just, just destroyed. Um, uh, the stress involved in this, I mean, they're in essence threatening five generations of work. And um, if they would to prevail in something like this, it's all gone. They take it all away. They take it all away. Good morning. Morning, sir. How, How are you this morning, Troy? I'm well. How are you, David? Still surviving? Good. <laughs> Troy Rausch and David Runyon grow conventional soybeans. They have been victims of the so-called gene police. Created by Monsanto to enforce its law in the fields, the gene police so fear in rural America, where farmers denounce the totalitarian methods used in a GMO-dominated world. I have some pictures here for you, Troy, I'd like you to look at. Okay. Here's what I have done, Troy, to uh, help prevent re-entry on my farm. Of anyone coming onto my farm. <laughs> Summer, it was in July of 2003, 
And they came, it was the latter part of July. They came to my house. It was uh, like 7 p.m. Who came? Uh, Monsanto employees. And they presented me a uh, business card. And uh, they asked me a few questions about the kind of soybeans I plant, the kind of corn I plant, uh, where I market my crops. And so I said, okay, that's the end of the conversation. Yeah, patents have changed. They've changed everything. It revolves with a, with, with a relationship of trust with neighbors. That is gone. Uh, my myself, I probably only have two farmers that I talk to that are close to me. Are they really afraid, the farmers? Of course they're afraid. You can't defend yourself against these people. They've created a little industry that, that serves no other purpose than to wreck farmers' lives. Um, of course they're afraid. Does that mean that you're afraid, for instance, that the neighbor can snitch on you? Yes. Yes? Yeah. Yes. All you have to do is... is Dial 1-800. Dial 1-800-Monsanto. Or no, I'm sorry, 1-800-Roundup. I remember encouraging farmers to uh, call this, this toll-free number and turn their neighbor in. And why does Monsanto do that? Well, the reason they do it is control. Seeds? Yeah. They want to control the seed. They want to own life. I mean, this is the building blocks of food we're talking about. They... They are in the process of owning food. All food. Between 1995 and 2005, Monsanto acquired over 50 seed companies throughout the world. These companies produce corn, cotton, wheat, and soybean, and also seeds for tomatoes, potatoes, and sorghum. Everywhere, people worry about Monsanto's monopoly, which in the long term threatens to wipe out all non-transgenic varieties. Monsanto doesn't agree and speaks only about the benefits of biotechnology, especially in developing countries like India. Our products provide significant economic benefits to both large and small growers. In many cases, farmers are able to grow higher quality and better yielding crops. India is the world's third largest cotton producer. In 1999, Monsanto acquired Mahiko, the country's leading seed company. Two years later, the Indian government authorized the sale of BT cotton under the brand name Balgard. It is genetically modified to produce an insecticide which repels ballworms, a cotton parasite. <laughs> Since 2001, Kiran Sakari and Abdul Gayam have been closely following the transgenic cotton grown by small farmers in the Warangal district. Every year, the two agronomists publish a report comparing bioengineered cotton with conventional cotton in terms of yields and production costs. In 2006, the harvest was ravaged by a disease that affects transgenic cotton. This is a Bolgard uh, field. Uh, I mean, we can see some of the rhizoctonia affected plants. You see, if you remove the bark of a healthy plant, it, will, it won't be like this, like threads. See, it's a classic example of rhizoctonia infestation. The farmers, they have said they have never seen that. And uh, when we were doing our study from 2001, we have noted this disease on very few samples in the BT cotton only. And as the time passed, the spread was seen more and more in the BT fields as well as some non-BT fields also. But I personally feel that there may be some interaction, undesirable interaction between the host plant where the gene was introduced and the gene which is carrying the BT. And that has introduced the weakness in the plant to not to resist this rhizoctonia. I have seen the.